Hello. My name is Tony Suttle, and I'm a member of the Hill Lane Gallery's panel of guides, artists, and lecturers. Today's short talk for about half an hour will be about a French-born artist, Armand, or Armand, and one of his works, a sculpture in bronze titled Cello Master, which is in the gallery's permanent collection. In normal times, these talks are coffee conversations are held at the gallery itself every Wednesday and are followed by a cup of tea or coffee and a chat among the attendees about the work discussed in the talk and about, of course, life in general. Today, uh, as I record this talk, uh, it's Wednesday. It's a Wednesday before the coffee conversation. And here in Dublin, it's a sunny sort of day, weather-wise. So whenever and wherever you are watching this talk on Armand and his cello master, possibly today in Dublin or elsewhere, I hope you too are having a cup of something nice to drink and possibly somebody to discuss it with afterwards. First, let's have a look at the work itself. It stands just over a meter high and as you can see, it's cast in bronze and is not a cello, the musical instrument, as we might normally expect to see it. The work was made by Armand in 1961, relatively early in his career. But before we consider Armand himself and some of his other works, shall we look at this piece and ask ourselves what we think about it? First, do you like it? Do we like to look at it? Is it visually interesting or appealing? And would we like to live with it in our own homes? What do you feel yourselves? I ask myself, why has Armand done what he appears to have done in this case? He appears to have taken a conventional cello and carefully sliced it into segments and then reassembled them and finally cast the result in bronze, which to me changes it totally from being a cello and from then being a non-playable cello into an object in its own right, with all the art historical resonance of being cast in bronze to ensure a very long existence where it will present itself for the viewer's consideration for many generations beyond Armand and our own lives. I find myself, as I look at it, seeing or imagining it as the original cello it was, then as a sliced and reconstructed cello-like object, but still consisting of wood and of string and keys. And then finally, as it is now, a bronze sculpture, which makes no sound, but fills our eyes and minds, possibly with musical thoughts and memories, and possibly with a modified understanding of what the physical world, including cellos, actually looks like. That's what happened to me when I first saw it at the Hugh Lane some years ago. What is happening to you now as you look at it on screen, meeting it perhaps for the first time? Arma, uh, first look at, let's look at his uh, biography. Uh, Armand, that is originally Armand with a D, was born Armand Fernandez in 1928 in France in the city of Nice where his father was an antiques dealer and also an amateur artist, a photographer and a cellist. Armand started his artistic education with his father, who taught him oil painting and photography. At college, he obtained a bachelor's degree in philosophy and mathematics, and then went on to study in Nice at the National College of Decorative Arts. However, while still in Nice, he also studied judo at the police school where he met two other artists who interest, also interested in judo, Yves Klein and the poet composer Claude Pascal. The three became friends and went on to bond during a hitchhiking tour around Europe. Armand himself went on to become for a while a teacher of judo in Madrid. He also served in the French army in the Indo-Chinese or later called the Vietnamese War. In 1949, he enrolled at the Ecole de Louvre in Paris where he studied archaeology and oriental art. In the early 1950s, Armand began his career as a painter, initially working in an abstract style, influenced by the Russian-born Nicholas de Stael. However, 
1954, he saw an exhibition of the work of the German Dadaist artist Kurt Schwitters. These are two photographs of Armand taken in his early 40s and 50s, respectively. Now, I should also mention at this point that during his early career as a form of homage or homage to Vincent van Gogh, Armand signed his work solely with his Christian or given name of Armand, the Theor, M-A-N-D, with a D. However, in 1957, in a poster for one of his exhibitions, the typesetter responsible made a typo mistake and left out the D. Rather than correct it, Armand liked the look of it and used it as his signature from then on. Then in 1973, in becoming a citizen of the United States, he took the American civil name Armand, A-R-M-A-N-D, Pierre Armand, A-R-M-A-N. So nevertheless, he continued to use Armand as his public persona. In 1960, before these photographs were taken, Armand and a group of other artists formed a semi-formal grouping, referring to themselves as the Nouveau Realist or New Realists. Among the group were his friend Yves Klein and also the kinetic sculptor Jean Tingeli, Nicky Saint Fal, one of whose works, Big Bird, we have in the gallery's collection, and also Christo, who became famous for wrapping buildings in large spaces, but whose career started with the wrapping of smaller domestic items. In their manifesto, drafted by the art critic and philosopher Pierre Restenay, the new realists define themselves as having in common new perspective approaches of reality. They were reassessing the concept of art and of the artist for a 20th century consumer society. The members of the new realist group tended to see the world as an image from which they could take parts and incorporate them into their works. They sought to bring life and art closer together and using a phrase from Pierre Restenay's manifesto, they used direct appropriation of reality, a poetic recycling of urban, industrial, and advertising reality. In this way, they sought to strip art of previously thought standards that art had to mean something. They could take any object beyond its preconceived notions and present it as itself and believed that it could still be considered art. In this way, the new realists advocated a return to reality in opposition to the lyricism of abstract painting. They also wanted to avoid what they saw as the traps of figurative art, which was seen as either petty bourgeois or as Stalinist socialist realism. The new realists made extensive use of, use of collage and assemblage, that's collecting stuff and assembling it, using real objects and incorporating them directly into the work, and in this way, acknowledging a debt to the ready-mades of Marcel Duchamp. The new realism movement could be looked at somewhat as a French-based equivalent to the pop art movement in London and New York for their use and critique of mass-produced commercial objects found in the works of Peter Blake and Andy Warhol and their contemporaries. So with that background information on Armand and his early years, let us consider for a while some questions about ourselves, about the actual making of art and what perhaps can be considered as art with a capital A. So as we look at Armand, his life, his work, we ask ourselves, is it essential that art be made of the conventional materials such as graphite or colored pigment on paper, board or canvas, and of stone, wood, or bronze for three-dimensional works. And we might also consider what happens between an artist and a viewer as we look at art, as I said, with a capital A. Should we, should we like it as an aesthetically or emotionally pleasing object? Should we like it for what it looks like visually or for any emotion it might conjure up in our own mind or for any intellectual insight it might generate regarding our own state of mind at the time, or possibly a mix of all of those reactions at the same time. So a lot of things to think about as we look at what Armand made during his career as an artist. So again, we ask how, about what, and with what 
should an artist make art? Mark making is what it's all about. So before continuing with Arma and his lifetime career in art making, let's look briefly at various ways through the history of art at how various artists have chosen to make marks on a surface or to create three-dimensional sculpture using non-conventional means and materials to do so. I will start with the late Renaissance artist Giuseppe Arcimboldo, who, <coughs> excuse me, although he used conventional materials to make his work, did so in a somewhat unconventional manner. Now, I must admit that his work does now not work particularly well for me, but that may be my problem. He was well considered and patronized in his day, and his works are still sought after and reach high prices at auction. And as you can see, he has used a composition of vegetables and fruits to make up what must have been an acceptable portrait likeness of Rudolf II. And also, throughout the Renaissance, many artists used the technique of collage or sticking on in their work that is attaching additional materials to the surface of a painting or a sculpture. Most common was the use of gold leaf to enrich the appearance of halos, crowns and garments in religious paintings and statues. Also gold, silver and on occasions precious and semi-precious stones might be attached to the surface of the work, painting or sculpture. I suggest that these traditions have some relevance to our discussion of Armand's use of collage and assemblage, and his combining of a variety of materials into his work to achieve a particular end result. An early pioneer of this approach in the early 20th century was the German Dadaist artist, Hannah Hoch. From an early age, she rebelled against the prevailing male-dominated structure of German society. She was a pioneer in the use of photomontage taking advantage of the proliferation of published print material and the use of photography in journalism and popular magazines and promotional and political material. As you can see in this work from 1919, titled Cut with a Kitchen Knife, Dada Through the Beer Belly of the Weimar Republic, she used her technique in a highly politicized and revolutionary manner. That said, Although her work was included in the Nazis' exhibition of degenerate art, she managed to maintain a low personal profile and remained mostly in Germany throughout the Weimar Republic era and the Second World War. Anna Hock's photomontage works influenced another German Dadaist, a Dadaist artist, Kurt Schwitters, of whose work Armand saw an exhibition in 1954 six years after Schritter's death. Schritter's, however, used a wider and more heterogeneous range of source materials than Hannah Hock's largely photographic images. This work, titled Opened by Customs, was made by Schritter's in 1937 in Norway, where Schritter's had fled following the rise of Nazism in Germany. The pasted down fragments come from a variety of sources, including wrapping paper, Nazi administrative labels, a blue label from a Spanish onion, and a printed list of travel-related words in German, including airline boarding pass, baggage insurance, and sleeping car, and so on. It has been suggested that the complex mesh of language and layers <coughs> excuse me, that comprise the work suggests a correspondingly complex web of ideas and emotions. The turmoil of the period experienced by Schwitters, as well as other German emigres, is conveyed through the conflicting languages, both printed and handwritten, and the red marks used using stamps, cutouts, and daubings. The titular German customs label, which takes a prominent position at the top left of the works, points to a lack of personal autonomy and compounds the sense that Schwitters is escaping ideological oppression. The overall lack of cohesion in the work, the texts run in several different directions, may be indicative of the upheaval that both the artist and the continent were undergoing at that time. Now, these two works, each by Picasso, are examples of his perpetual exploration of the boundaries within which art might be made. 
Both are examples of assemblage or the selection and assembling of miscellaneous bits and pieces to create something new with perhaps something new to say. As you can see, the image on the upper left titled Bull's Head is made from an old bicycle seat and handlebars. It must have appealed to Picasso's lifelong interest and attendance at bullfighting with their drama and terror. That said, it can be described as a three-dimensional sculptural doodle, but I feel none the worse for that. A doodle by a master such as Picasso or Matisse is for me always something worth examining. The second piece, She Goat, was made 10 years later when Picasso was living in the south of France and experimenting with ceramics. Initially, he assembled it from scraps, including broken ceramics and dead vegetation, including palm, land, palm leaves or palm fronds. Then it was cast in bronze two years later. Now, whatever it may have looked like in its original form, I suggest that once cast in bronze, the work takes on a completely different persona and significance, if not importance, whatever that might be caused by. I believe that what might have started as an interesting or even amusing doodle becomes somehow more significant and demanding our attention when cast in bronze. Now, this is a work by Eve Klein. He, you will remember, was also born in Nice and was a contemporary friend and collaborator of Armand. He, Nice, or he, Yves Klein, is best known for his not using paintbrushes and for his development and patenting of a particular shade of blue, a deep royal blue, named Klein blue. He applied his colours, sometimes using only his own Klein blue, without the use of a brush. Here, he is playing around with that classic motif in art, the female nude, by painting his models themselves and then applying the model's painted bodies directly to the paper. Here I am showing the images of two well-known works that can be described as having been made in a non-traditional manner. The first on the upper left, titled Bicycle Wheel, is by Marcel Duchamp, a French-born artist who also spent much of his later career in the United States where he was met by Armand. Duchamp is a key figure in the development of conceptual art, where the idea or concept behind a work of art is considered more significant than the work itself or its visual appearance. The Irish artist and commentator Brian O'Doherty has suggested that if Picasso was the most important artist of the first half of the last century, Duchamp is the most important of the second half. And here Duchamp takes two potentially useful items and by combining them renders them both worthless in terms of their usual functions. He decided in making objects of this type to call them ready-mades. It's been suggested that Duchamp's invention of the ready-mades was probably his greatest contributions to the art of the 20th century ready-mades completely upended so many ideas of what art needed to be in order to be considered art. It's, today, this piece would probably be categorized as kinetic sculpture as the wheel is intended by Duchamp to be spun. And the second work, My Bed, was made just at the end of the last century by Tracy Eamon. Eamon was one of the group known as the YBAs, or Young British Artists, whose revolutionary attitudes and methods caused ripples in the art world at that time. Tracy Eamon is now a respected member of the Royal Academy in London. My bed is just that. It is a reassembling of her bed and its contents and immediate surrounding, or surrounding objects, at a particularly difficult moment in time in Eamon's personal life. So having started this section of my talk with Archambaldo's portrait of Rudolf II, can I suggest that Eamon's My Bed can be considered as possibly one of the most courageous and revealing autobiographical self-portraits in art history, irrespective of how it happens to be made. So having looked at how over the years, 
artists have chosen to make art using non-conventional approaches and materials. Let us return to Armand and his sculptural work, Cello Master. We will look at it in the context of other works made by him during his working life as a full-time and successful, financially successful as well, a successful artist. You might also like to decide for yourself if you feel that Armand may have been influenced by the fact that his father was a cello player, a collector, and an antique dealer selling to other collectors of a range of different types of object. Having started in the early 1950s as a painter, working in a somewhat abstract style, in the mid 1950s, Armand started making this type of work, working from a collection of official and commercial rubber stamps. He made this work where he used the stampings as his mark maker. Armand had developed the practice of collecting large quantities of the same item, the same article, such as the rubber stamps from which he had made this and similar works. He then moved on relatively quickly from using one of his collection or accumulations as a means of making marks to showing the collected items in their own right, initially encased in glass covered boxes or in perspex. The public and critical reaction to his exhibition of his selected and assembled items was favorable, and he moved on to showing in a number of exhibitions, a gallery full of filled garbage bins, representing both his accumulated or collected garbage for a week or a day or whatever. And this, if you wish, could represent both an autobiographical comment on his daily existence, or perhaps a commentary on the waste of contemporary lifestyles, or perhaps simply a thing of material beauty in its own right. Think about it. Can you see your weekly submission to Panda as the ugly duckling of contemporary art? This next work, as you can see, is one of his accumulations titled Arterial Sclerosis, where, as with other contemporary conceptual style artists, such as Duchamp, he uses his titling in a somewhat humorous and satirical, but perhaps indicative manner. This work, made somewhat later in Armand's career, is one of a number of uh, editions of this work, in, in a sort of variety of various locations around the world. This one is in Shanghai. And as you can see, it is also derived, <coughs> excuse me, from an unusual treatment of the component musical instrument and is somewhat reminiscent of our cello master. This next one, uh, one of Armand's largest works, titled Long-Term Parking, was made in 1982 and consists of 60 odd motor cars, mostly French, set in concrete. It is on permanent display at the Chateau de Montcel, <coughs> excuse me, in France. As you can see, it is consistent with his practice of assembling and presenting ordinary objects in an unusual manner, perhaps commenting on one aspect of our motor car based society. And this is a late work by Armand also, as you can see, featuring a musical instrument. I'm going to leave it to yourselves to decide what you think about it. So we will finish where we started with Armand's cello master. For myself, I continue to enjoy looking at this silent version of uh, a musical instrument. I feel Armand has helped me to look both at cellos and at the world in a slightly alternative way. I will leave it to you to make up your own minds about our man, his cello and the world in general. Thank you for joining me today. Continue to enjoy looking at art and listening to music. Goodbye for now.